Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris, Assistant Professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. Well, uh, yesterday, Senate Democrats, led by Elizabeth Warren and others, stymied their own president's trade deal when they blocked fast-track authority for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The TPP is a multi-nation so-called free trade treaty that many see as NAFTA on steroids. This morning, Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid offered a concession to the GOP, which backs Obama on the TPP, but his offer was not accepted. Democrats are pushing for greater worker protection as a condition. One of the countries that have expressed interest in joining the TPP is the Philippines, where a major fire at a footwear factory in Manila this morning claimed dozens of lives. The fire may have started when a welding spark hit flammable chemicals. More than 65 workers were trapped inside, and so far there are no reported survivors. Courtney, won't the TPP make the already non-existent worker protections around the world even weaker? And do you see the Senate vote as a major victory? Uh, well, I think the Senate vote is a step in the right direction, although it's only the first of many battles um, that we're going to see because this is an issue that's not going to go away. But in terms of this, uh, the TPP really threatening labor protections, absolutely this is going to be an issue. Public Citizen has done some really amazing work uh, on the potential consequences of this agreement. And one of the key features of the agreement is that it would allow corporations to sue countries if they pass forms of legislation or policy that would essentially cut into their bottom line. So if things like environmental protections or labor protections or the defense of net neutrality get in the way of acquiring profits, uh, a corporation can sue. And this is something that I think really poses a threat to state sovereignty and really undermines the abilities of national governments to protect their citizens. So, uh, you know, I think we should be wary not only of the kind of trickle up uh, model of that these kind of neoliberal trade reforms espouse, but we should also really be attentive to the kind of anti-democratic impulses of these agreements uh, and, and the dangers that they pose to workers and to the environment and to state sovereignty. Human Rights Watch has released a groundbreaking first-of-its-kind report detailing the abuse of mentally ill prisoners. But the report didn't focus on China, Saudi Arabia, or other supposedly repressive regimes. It was about the U.S.'s brutal prison system, and its title says it all. Callous and cruel use of force against inmates with mental disabilities in U.S. jails and prison. The group accused U.S. prison authorities of, quote, unnecessary, excessive, and even malicious force on prisoners with mental disabilities such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. It detailed how officials, quote, needlessly and punitively deluge mentally ill prisoners with chemical sprays, shock them with electric stun devices, strap them to chairs and beds for days on end, break their jaws, noses, ribs, or leave them with lacerations, secondary degree burns, deep bruises, and damaged internal organs. HRW contends that this abuse has contributed to the deaths of prisoners. Courtney, this is such a deeply disturbing report. Can you imagine how U.S. media would be covering it if it was about another country? I mean, if it were another country, say somewhere in Africa or the Middle East, the narrative would sound completely different. We'd be framing it as a massive uh, human rights crisis uh, and, and a crisis of democratic governance, and that's exactly what it is. And, and it's shocking to see how deep these problems are here in the United States. But, you know, I think this is something that we really have to think about as it relates to the prison industrial complex in the United States. We have the largest prison system in the world. We incarcerate more of our population than any other country in the world, including Russia and China. Uh, and we really uh, have treated mental illness as a problem that society doesn't want to deal with, and we allow prisons to be warehouses where the mentally ill are kept. And prisons are woefully under-equipped and under-trained to deal with these kinds of issues. And this is the logical outcome uh, when you use punitive measures to deal with what is essentially a public health problem. And finally, today is the 30th anniversary of the only aerial police bombing on U.S. soil, an event most Americans have never even heard of. On May 13, 1985, Philadelphia police dropped a bomb on top of a house inhabited by members of an African-American political organization called MOVE in a predominantly black neighborhood. Eleven people were killed, among them five children. Only two people survived. A 13-year-old boy named Michael Ward, who died two years ago after years of therapy for the trauma he suffered, and a woman named Ramona, Africa. Africa will join Cornell West, Alice Walker, and others in commemorating the bombing on Osage Avenue in Philadelphia today. Meanwhile, journalist and political prisoner Mumia Abu Jamal, who has kept the story of the move bombing alive and worked closely with its members, continues to suffer a serious medical condition in prison. Prison Radio has just announced this morning that Abu Jamal was transferred to a hospital and remains in grave condition. 
Well, Courtney, if the police had bombed a house of white Americans and killed six adults and five children, how different do you imagine, to ask a similar question to the previous one, how different would that narrative be today? Uh, I think it'd probably be as different as if police shot and killed an unarmed white civilian every 28 hours, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there would be a mass outcry um, and it would be rightfully criticized as a violation of the rights that we uh, enjoy or at least should enjoy as citizens. Um, but that's clearly not what happened in the case of the MOVE bombing. And as you said, that story has been written out of history in the same way that the bombing in 1921 of the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a predominantly black community was also experienced uh, bombing, aerial bombing from the state. Uh, that story has been written out of history. We have a long, long, ugly and brutal history of racist state violence in this country that we have to contend with if we're gonna be able to deal with the problems that we're facing now. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's horrifying that we fail to talk about this. All right. And people can find out more information, by the way, about the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal and his current medical condition at prisonradio.org. Courtney, thanks as always for joining us today. Bye, Sonali. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African-American and women's studies at Penn State University. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.